Well, welcome to our memorial meeting uh, this morning. We give you a very warm welcome to meet with us around the Lord's table. We're going to open up our time together, first of all, with a song, and then I'm going to ask if you might bow your heads while we approach the throne of grace in prayer. So here's our opening song. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great throne of grace to praise your great and holy name to thank you loving God for calling us to be your sons and your daughters for calling us to be your children for calling us to be a part of your amazing promises and we pray loving father for the soon return of your son we we pray for your kingdom to come soon we pray for you to accept of our thanks for this time and this fellowship that we're able to share together we ask that you might bless our time around this table we offer our thanks and our praises for all your blessings in and through Jesus Christ's name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 20 and verses 1 to 16, we have the parable of the labourers in the vineyard. The parable itself has its background in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16, where a rich young man comes to Jesus and asks Jesus what he has to do to inherit eternal life. And, and Jesus goes on and, and, and talks about riches being stumbling blocks and, and how that this young man was to give away his riches and follow Jesus, and he couldn't do that. And Jesus continues with that theme when he comes with his disciples in chapter 20 of, of Matthew, and he opens up by saying the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like unto, and he talks about this parable. And so the parable is bookended by these words, the first to be last, the last to be first, and the fact that it's a parable about the kingdom of God. That's the essence that we want to make sure that we, we, we don't lose track of as we go along on this story. And the story opens with the owner of a vineyard. The vineyard is going to represent God's world, God's creation. It's God's. The vineyard owner is God himself. And it opens up by saying that he goes out to hire labourers to work in his vineyard. It's harvest time. It's, it's the time of harvesting. And so God is calling, or, or, the, or the owner, is calling people 
to harvest his vineyard, just like God is calling people for the harvest, calling us to go out and preach the good news of the kingdom of God so that you know, those that would believe will come into the family of God. So that's the theme of what this parable is all about. And of course, when he goes out, the first group that he calls at six o'clock in the morning, they're going to work a 12-hour day. The first group he makes an agreement with. It's like there's a law that I'm going to pay them a penny a day. I'm going to pay them a denarius a day. It was a very, very generous salary. It was overs. It was well overs what a normal piecemeal payment for a day's work would be. But that was the agreement and that's what was locked in. During the course of the day from nine o'clock, midday, three o'clock, and even five o'clock, an hour before closing time at six o'clock in the evening, the owner went out and called others. And that's just like God has been calling people to his family ever since you know, the, 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 the creation. So, so this, this parable is about our calling into the kingdom, into the family of God. And what we know is that at the end of the, the, the 12 o'clock period, at 6 o'clock in the evening, the owner of the vineyard asked his foreman to get everybody together, put them in a line, and he was going to pay them because the order of the day was to pay for piecemeal workers at the end of each day. The interesting thing and the, the, the thing that is not normal is that he put the people that were last first in line. Normally you'd, you'd pay the people that worked the longest, but in this occasion he put those that had worked the shortest time first and paid them and worked his way up to those that had worked the longest. And of course you can imagine you know, in, in this story that as they lined up and, and those that had worked only one hour were at the front of the queue and they were given the penny or the denarius, as it was, that at the back of the queue, they'd be getting very excited, thinking, wow, wow, this is amazing. He's just paid those people a, a, a denarius for an hour's work, and, and we've worked 12, and, you know, by, by my maths, that, that means we're, we're going to get 12 denarius. This, this is awesome. But, of course, by the time they got to the front of the queue, they also got a denarius. And with that, of course, you know, trouble broke out, and they complained, and they murmured, and, you know, it's not fair. It's not fair. That's not right. You know, we worked all day. We worked in the heat of the day. You know, these Johnny come late. These they, they only work for one hour in the cool of the day. You know, that's not fair. You've you've made us equal to them. The Bible says. The word says. And so they complained about the way that this owner had treated them, to the point where the owner reminds them that they had an agreement. An agreement for a very, very generous salary. A very, very generous agreement. And so as a consequence, he dismisses them. Tells them, you know, pack your bags off my property. Don't come back. Don't come back tomorrow. Don't come back next week. And so they were, they were told to, to leave the vineyard. They had an evil eye, we're told in verse 15. They were jealous and they were envious. And then... Jesus concludes by the last will be first and the first will be last. And so, you know, what, what's it all about? What, what's this parable really about? You know, because we know that parables are like a hidden message. You know, a, a parable is, is designed to both conceal and reveal. And a parable is like, it's like an iceberg. You know, you, you see the tip of an iceberg but if you look underneath the surface, there's so much more to that iceberg. And, and really, that's what these parables are all about. And so Jesus giving this parable. And, and so as Jesus draws closer and closer to the time of his crucifixion, there's a sense of urgency about getting these messages out, about getting his teachings out, because it's becoming more demanding that, 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 that he has... The opportunity for his disciples to understand what a life of sacrifice and a, and a journey in the truth is all about. And, and the, the, the challenge for us is that, that we are also on that journey. And we need to ask ourselves, well, how's our journey of faith going? Are we being distracted by, by things that are going on to our left and our right? The, the whole point of this parable, the whole point of this parable is that God is going to reward or offer a gift, a generous gift. 
It's all about God's generosity. We need to understand that. This is all about God's grace. Those workers who had the initial agreement had been given an opportunity to earn way above their normal pay grade. It was a generous offer. It was a generous opportunity. It was undeserved by their skill because they were unskilled labourers. And so the earlier workers made it all about fairness. And it's interesting when we, when we think about fairness because sometimes we don't necessarily act very fairly in our lives as well. We, we get distracted, we get jealous, we get envious about other things that are happening in other people's lives and question, well, why, why don't I get that blessing? Or why, why haven't I got that in my life? And, and the question we need to ask ourselves is, you know, how often do we get distracted? How often or how quickly does our commitment to God get lost when we focus on other people, when we focus on other things? Because that's exactly what's happening here. The problem here is that the early workers who started first got to see what the Johnny-come-latelys got when they lined up for their pay and they thought they deserved more. They thought they deserved more. And I think the, 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 the question is, well, why did, the, why did the owner do it that way? Why did he line the people up that way? And I think the disciples were probably asking the same question as well. Remember why this parable is being given. It's about the rich man, young man, who asks, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And how this parable is bookended with those two statements, the first to be last and the last to be first. Now, in the vineyard, the owner paid the labourers for their work. He paid them a denarius. It was a generous payment. But what he didn't do, what he didn't do is he didn't pay them what they deserved. I want you to understand that. They didn't deserve a denarius. That, that was the payment that was given to Roman soldiers and, and, and to far more qualified and experienced and educated people. The denarius, they, there would be nobody else offering that sort of payment. So they would have thought, wow, it's my lucky day when this owner offered them a denarius because they know that they couldn't earn that anywhere else. But what this parable is all about is it's about this owner who didn't pay them what they deserved. He paid them what they needed. He paid them what they needed. He paid them and he pays us with grace, with undeserved grace, with unearned grace. We can't earn grace and we certainly don't deserve grace. None of them deserved what they got. And this parable is highlighting that. This parable does two things. It shows the hearts of those earlier labourers, but more importantly, it shows the heart of the vineyard owner. Remember, this parable is all about the kingdom of God. The vineyard owner is calling people to his vineyard. He's calling labourers to his vineyard. And the first group were the entitled Jews, working for their salvation, working under the law, working under agreement. But those that followed worked under an arrangement, an arrangement of trust, an arrangement of belief. And that's what, we, that, that, that's what, that's what our lives are all about. Our lives in Christ, our lives as brothers and sisters of Jesus, our lives as sons and daughters of God, is a life of faith and trust. And we've, we've all been called into, into different, from different circumstances and we've all been called at different times. 
And, and some of us have been called early and some of us have been called late. But the question is, out of all these groups, who do we identify with? And we pray that we don't identify with that first group. Because if we do, then we're under law and, and, and we're, we're somehow of the view that if I do this and do that and, and, and do that long enough and hard enough, somehow I'm going to deserve eternal life. And that's not going to work. That's not the way it is. The first workers thought they deserved more. But the danger for them and for us is this. We really don't want more. We really don't want what we deserve. We don't. We don't want what we deserve because what we deserve is death. If we choose to live under grace, then we live. If we choose to live under the law, under agreements, then we're going to have certain death. But if we're going to live under grace, then there's certain responsibilities that go with that. We have to acknowledge and accept, just like that landowner said, you've got to go and work in the vineyard. You don't just go and sit around the vineyard. You've got to go and work in the vineyard. Jesus says in this parable to those at 9, 12, 3 and 5 o'clock to go. They were, they were idle in the marketplace. And he called them to go and work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever's right. We've been called to work in God's vineyard. And in, 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 in Matthew chapter 9 and verses 36 to 38, we read these words. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were scattered and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. He's calling us. He's talking to us. The laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We have a responsibility to work for our Lord, for our God. We are workers in his fields. We are workers in the vineyard. Mark 16, verses 15 to 16 says that Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. There's our work in God's vineyard, in this corner of his vineyard. He says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, to everybody. Whosoever believes and is baptized will be saved. They will be saved. But whosoever believes not will be condemned. Jesus told Peter in Matthew chapter 19, verse 25, you don't spend or give things up for God. We don't spend or give things up for God. I know sometimes we think we do. I know sometimes we think we're giving up this, we're giving up that, but we don't. What we do is we invest in God because that's what verse 29 of chapter 19 of Matthew says. You invest in God because you get 100 fold. It's like investing in the share market where you put 100 rand in and a year later you get 1,000 rand back. Jesus says if you invest in God, you get a 100 fold return on your investment because you get the gift of grace. Jesus says in this parable, whatsoever's right, I'll give you. Amen. Before we partake of the bread and the wine, let us read from Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so before we partake of the bread, let us offer a word of thanks. Loving, eternal, heavenly Father, we praise you, we give thanks that you have called us to be your children. We thank you for this time and this opportunity, loving Father, now that as we prepare to partake of this bread, the symbol of your son's body, that, that we might reflect on the things that we have considered this morning and that we might look to him as our example, that we might be more like him, loving Father, in the days that remain. And so as we partake of this bread of your son's body, we, we pray for your strength, for your encouragement, 
for your guidance in all things, offering our thanks through his name, even our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so it's recorded that he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And Jesus took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. Before we partake of the cup, we'll just offer a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we come to you again to continue our praise and our worship of you, to acknowledge you, loving Father, and to seek your mercy and your grace as we now partake of this cup of this wine, the wine symbolising your, your son, your only son's shed blood. And we know, loving Father, that though were difficult times and the enormity of the sacrifice of your son is not lost on us. But loving Father, we, we plead, we beg for your forgiveness for our failings. For where your son didn't fail, we have. And we ask, loving Father, for you to wash us clean. We plead with you for that mercy. We plead for your grace. We thank you for all your blessings. We pray, loving Father, that you'll send your son back to this earth soon. We offer our thanks through Jesus Christ's name. Amen. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Thanks uh, very much for being with us all once again. We pray and trust that uh, you're enjoying and finding this uh, fellowship around these eminent beneficial to our, our walk of faith. I'm sad to hear today of the, uh, the recent outbreak uh, in the southern uh, countries of, of, of Africa. Um, I pray and trust that you keep yourself safe and well during these difficult times and, and pray that you'll keep supporting and helping each other and keep in touch Make sure you're all looking after yourselves. We're going to close our time together, first of all, with a song and then with a closing prayer. So until we meet again, I pray God will be with you, will keep you safe and keep you well. So until then, bye for now.
Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you this day to pray for your kingdom to come, for your son to return to heal this fallen world and its broken people. For those who need Jesus more today than they did yesterday, and we pray, Father, that you will send Jesus back to save us from destroying the world and ourselves. We thank you, Father, for our daily provision of food. We thank you for life, for love, for health, for strength, for breath, and the measure of health that we enjoy. We pray, Father, for those that are struggling, for the poor, for those that have lost their jobs, the lonely, those that are mourning, the lost, those that have left the family of God. Be with us now, Father, as we come before you to worship you in the beauty of holiness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.